On this Monday night, Saskatchewan's Family Day weekend marred by a deadly fire. What first responders discovered when they got to the scene. Ultimatum, Israel's new order to Hamas, as Israel's policies are scrutinized. What does international law mean for Palestinian children in Gaza? Carrying on Alexei Navalny's unrelenting campaign against the Kremlin, his widow's message, plus what Canada is giving to Ukraine to fight Russian forces. And he combated racism and battled in wars. William was distinctively described as steady as a rock under fire. Remembering William Hall, the first black person and first Nova Scotian awarded Britain's highest military honor. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Sonia Sunger. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with new details of tragedy in Saskatchewan, where a house fire has killed five people, including children. The fire happened just after noon on Sunday in the town of Davidson, around halfway between Regina and Saskatoon. Catherine Ludwig joins us now from the scene tonight with what we know so far. Catherine. Sonia, on Sunday, Craig RCMP responded to a house fire in Davidson, and when they arrived, there were still people inside the home while it was burning. Five people are now dead after the fire, two seniors and three children. The seniors were removed from the scene and then pronounced dead later in hospital. And it wasn't until after the fire was extinguished that firefighters found the remains of three children. The autopsies are being done in Saskatoon later this week. Back to you, Sonia. Catherine Ludwig in Davidson, Saskatchewan. Thank you. And late this afternoon, RCMP confirmed their investigation has wrapped up and that the fire was not suspicious. In the Middle East, Hamas has been given an ultimatum. Israel's war cabinet member says that if all hostages are not released by Ramadan, which begins on March 10th, the IDF will launch a ground offensive on the crowded city of Rafah in southern Gaza. And as Israel continues to face criticism for the deaths of tens of thousands of Palestinian civilians, the International Court of Justice began hearings examining the legality of Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories. Redmond Shannon reports. A small group of protesters in The Hague welcomes a Palestinian legal team as it arrives at the International Court of Justice. The delegation came to address what they say is a root cause of the misery and grief experienced by Palestinians and Israelis, occupation and the denial of statehood. What does international law mean for Palestinian children in Gaza today? It has protected neither them nor their childhood. It has not protected their families. This is day one of a case requested by the UN General Assembly over a year ago. It asked the court for an advisory opinion on Israel's policies in the occupied Palestinian territories, including the ongoing construction of Jewish settlements in the West Bank. The best and possibly the last hope for the two-state solution that is so vital to the needs of both peoples is for the court to declare illegal the main obstacle to that solution, the ongoing Israeli occupation of Palestine, and for it to pronounce in the clearest possible terms that international law requires that this entire illegal enterprise be terminated. The case is separate from last month's International Court of Justice genocide case against Israel. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he does not recognize the legitimacy of the court proceedings, which he says are an effort designed to infringe on Israel's right to defend itself against existential threats. Israel's lack of recognition is part of the reason Canada argued that the case shouldn't be going ahead. Canada was said to be among 51 other nations to present at the court this week, but Canada withdrew from the process on Monday. A ruling will likely take months and would be non-binding, but in the current political climate, it could add to international pressure on Israel.
Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. The European Union has launched a naval mission in the Red Sea to protect cargo ships from Houthi rebel attacks. The European Commission president announced the decision today, saying Europe will ensure freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. European warships and airborne warning systems will be deployed, but the EU mission will not partake in any military strikes. Iran-backed Houthis say their attacks are in solidarity with the people of Gaza. The U.S. and U.K. have retaliated, bombing multiple Houthi targets in Yemen. Today, a Houthi spokesperson said the group hit and caused catastrophic damage to a U.K.-registered Belize-flagged and Lebanese-operated cargo ship. The attack happened yesterday off the coast of Yemen in the Gulf of Aden. British maritime officials confirmed an explosion in close proximity of the vessel and say the crew abandoned ship and are all safe. There are renewed calls for Western allies to keep funding the fight against Russian aggression after Ukrainian troops retreated from the frontline city of Avdivka. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says soldiers were running out of weapons. As Mackenzie Gray reports, Ottawa says it will not waver in its support, sending hundreds of high-tech Canadian-made drones to Ukraine starting this spring. There's not much left of Avdivka, the Ukrainian town at the center of months of brutal fighting that late last week fell into Russian hands. A scene that could soon be replayed in other parts of eastern Ukraine. The New York Times reporting Russia is advancing on four other cities with 40,000 troops in total, an ominous sign for Ukraine, who's short on manpower and ammunition. A situation Canada is trying to play a small part in fixing. Canada is investing over $95 million to provide Ukraine with more than 800 Sky Ranger R-70 drones. These are made right here in Canada. Those drones will be used to defend against future Russian attacks, and the first batch will arrive by the end of next month. But the donation isn't from new money. It's a part of a package originally announced back in June 2023. And it's new cash and weapons that Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky needs desperately. But its biggest donor, the U.S., can't seem to pass a $60 billion aid package. And the idea that now, if you're running out of ammunition, you walk away, I find it absurd. Find it unethical. The bill made it through the Senate with substantial bipartisan support, but the Republican-controlled House of Representatives is on a two-week vacation. And even when they're back, GOP leadership won't allow a vote. If the package that's running through the Congress right now, $61 billion of supplemental aid to Ukraine goes through, I have to be honest to you, that is not going to fundamentally change the reality on the battlefield. That sentiment shared by many allies of Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump who are pushing for political gridlock. Trump simply doesn't want to see Biden being able to govern, and therefore he and his supporters block everything. A domestic political battle that could make or break how long Ukraine can hold out. Mackenzie Gray, Global News, Ottawa. Three days on, the world is no closer to knowing how Alexei Navalny died. The body of the Russian opposition leader has not been released. Navalny's widow says Russian investigators are buying time to cover up his murder. And as Mike Armstrong reports today, Yulia Navalnaya had a pointed message for Vladimir Putin. The threat of being arrested isn't enough to keep some Russians away. Monuments to political prisoners have become, since his death, memorials to Alexei Navalny. St. Petersburg Monday, flowers are removed by local authorities, but new ones keep coming. That, despite just two days ago in the same city, a crackdown by police. Dozens were detained for remembering the late opposition leader. In a video released Monday, Navalny's widow calls on Russians to share her rage. Vladimir Putin, she says, killed her husband to kill the hopes, freedom and future of the Russian people. Navalny's widow is also accusing authorities of hiding his body. For a third day, his mother was denied access to the morgue where the body is believed to have been moved. Now, this was Navalny Thursday. He appeared in court by video conference from the penal colony where he was serving a 30-year sentence. Russian authorities say a day later, he collapsed after a walk, lost consciousness and died. 
Navalny's wife says she believes the government isn't handing over his remains as part of a cover-up. She says it's waiting for traces of a nerve agent used to poison him to leave the body. The Russian ambassador to the UN says the cause of death hasn't been determined, insisting that's why the body hasn't been released. Well, I think that the reason is simple, because the forensic medical investigation is not over yet. Navalny's widow is promising to continue his fight. Monday, she was in Brussels meeting with EU foreign ministers. It was an already scheduled meeting to discuss further sanctions against Russia over its invasion of Ukraine. Well, new sanctions may be hard to find, considering how many there are already. A former Navalny ally is calling on Western governments to instead confiscate billions of dollars from the Russian central bank reserves, money that's already been frozen, suggesting it be called the Navalny Act. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. In Papua New Guinea, at least 26 people have been killed in tribal fighting. Police say most of the victims were shot during an ambush in the country's northern highlands. An influx of illegal firearms has reportedly made tribal violence worse in the region. The Pacific Island nation is home to hundreds of tribes, many of which still live in remote areas. Swatting targeting politicians. Coming up, what's becoming a dangerous problem in the U.S. presidential election campaign? Creeks are swelling in Northern California as wet weather soaks the region. Flood watches cover most of the area and forecasters are warning of strong winds, hail and even tornadoes. The storm is expected to move through quicker than the atmospheric river that killed nine people in Southern California earlier this month. A political storm is brewing in the U.S. There are fears the 2024 presidential election could fuel acts of violence and intimidation, which are already happening with alarming frequency. In recent weeks, dozens of politicians, judges and political commentators have faced so-called swatting attacks. Those are fake 911 calls designed to trigger a deadly police response. As Jackson Prosco reports, experts warn it could be the beginning of a dangerous Trend. A security camera captured the moment police arrived with guns drawn at Rick Wilson's Florida home. I walked out on a cold and rainy stormy night in my in my boxers and a t-shirt, had my hands up. Uh, I knew what it was. I'd been swatted. The local sheriff was responding to a fake 911 call claiming the veteran political operative killed his wife and had a weapon. In the dead of night, Wilson says heavily armed officers started banging on his door. It is shocking to uh, be standing there with a bunch of guys with AR-15s. God forbid you come out there with a gun thinking it's somebody else trying to assault you and not the police. You get killed. Recent swatting attacks have targeted everyone from the special counsel investigating Donald Trump to federal judges and members of Congress from both parties. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley was hit twice in one week. The last thing you want is to see multiple law enforcement officials with guns drawn pointing at my parents. The FBI has launched a national swatting database as the Justice Department sounds the alarm. A deeply disturbing spike in threats against those who serve the public. Researchers of domestic extremism see swatting calls as part of a growing trend toward political violence and intimidation. The norms of civility have frayed in the United States. Three years after the attack on the Capitol, and nine months ahead of the next election, there are threats from anti-government militias and lone actors like the man who attacked an FBI field office days after agents searched Donald Trump's Florida home. We have this permissive environment right now, whether that's because of leadership or particularly pervasive conspiracy theories that are driving certain individuals and groups um, towards violence. Swatting attacks may be the canary in the coal mine, part of a political climate where directed violence becomes normalized, even expected. It's not just about the temperature, it's also about the volume of moments, the number of opportunities at which somebody could conduct an act of violence. In a country where there are more guns than people, it's a worrying sign. Ahead of November's election, those who've already been victimized openly worry about what comes next. The terrifying part will be when it's not just the crazy people, when it's the people who think, I'm going to support my president by killing somebody he doesn't like. 
While politically motivated violence has skewed toward the far right, it's not exclusive to it. And as violence becomes increasingly normalized, the most extreme on both sides may feel emboldened to act. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Anti-Semitic hate ahead, the struggle to suppress an increase in targeted violence in this country. The effects of Hamas's October 7th attack on Israel and ensuing war in Gaza are not just isolated to the Middle East. It's ignited a sharp rise in anti-Semitism here in Canada. Jeff Semple speaks with some of the victims in these cases. Morning. Students at this Jewish elementary school in Montreal head to their classrooms and past bullet holes. Oh my God. The school's principal and rabbi says early one morning in November, before students arrived, someone fired through the front entrance. Then a few days later, it happened again. Certainly a lot of panic within the community that someone would do this at all. Um, and, and to a school where three-year-old kids are playing with blocks. And it's not a political statement. It's, it's hatred. Police across Canada are responding to a torrent of hatred. Jewish Canadians, just 1% of the population, were by far the most targeted. A Global News analysis found every major city where data was available reported a spike in anti-Semitism last year, resulting in a dramatic surge nationally compared with the previous year, though Ottawa and Montreal didn't have numbers for 2022. And most incidents happened after Hamas attacked Israel. In Vancouver, there were more reports of anti-Semitic hate after October the 7th than in all of 2022. The targets include businesses like this cafe, tagged with graffiti and flooded with negative reviews. I'm not Israeli, I'm Jewish. It all starts with the little things like this, and if nothing's done about it, it's easy to escalate. And homes like this one in tiny Wishago, Ontario, where the Morovitz family received death threats. I didn't want to believe it. I mean, this is a town of less than 200 people, 6,000 miles away from any conflict that's happening. And yet somebody felt that it was necessary to threaten myself and my family. The city with the most reports of anti-Semitism since October 7th is Montreal, targeting synagogues and schools. I personally have felt safer in a bomb shelter than in the streets of Montreal. In November, this Jewish student and others at Concordia University set up a display for Israeli hostages. A pro-Palestinian group set up their own table nearby. Are you okay with genocide? Are you justifying genocide? Videos show this student shouting at the Jewish group, then grabbing their Israeli flag. Moments later, chaos. <laughs> Three people were injured. A 22-year-old student was arrested. This Jewish student recorded video of the altercation. We've been threatened on campus by students, by fellow students. They've, these students have been emboldened by professors. People are seeing these horrific images and stories coming out of Gaza, and they're angry. Why are you holding random Jews accountable for the actions of Israel? <laughs> Muslims in Canada have also faced a recent rise in hate crimes, though far fewer than those against Jews. A country that prides itself on diversity and inclusion. Now struggling to suppress a rising hate. Jeff Semple, Global News, Montreal. And Global News is airing a special report, Rising Hate, Anti-Semitism in Canada. You can watch that right here on Saturday at 7 p.m. Buried without military honors. Next, paying tribute to the first black person awarded the Victoria Cross. It's a statutory holiday for most of Canada today. That includes Nova Scotia, which celebrates an important historical figure from the province with Heritage Day. This year's edition recognized William Hall, who became the first black person and first Nova Scotian to be awarded Britain's highest military decoration. Heidi Petrochik shows us how Hall was honored today. Steady as a rock. It's how William Hall was described several times at this special Heritage Day celebration. An example of service and dedication 
to everyone. Born in 1827 to parents who were once American slaves, Hall loved shipbuilding from a young age and was later drawn to life at sea with the Royal Navy. Distinction, it seems, runs in the family. Hall descendant Craig Gibson himself, the first black commanding officer in the RCMP. He was committed in what he was doing and believed in what he was doing. When Hall joined the Navy, the color of his skin meant enlisting was an act of determination. I think it's something like being policing when you take an oath. It doesn't so much become about a color race. He did it for a dedication for his country. Diversity wasn't what it is today. And I'm sure that, you know, he faced some irremarkable odds when it came to racial discrimination. The event that garnered Hall the Victoria Cross occurred during the Indian Rebellion of 1857, after he survived a barrage of fire to man a heavy gun to help capture a fortified palace. He had to pull the can itself and fire until his enforcement came, they were able to breach. Regarded as India's first war of independence, for Hall, serving under Britain during the conflict was a matter of duty. He eventually returned to Nova Scotia to live a quiet farming life. And when he died in 1904, there were no military honours. Three decades later, community members started a movement to recognise him. He was depicted in a commemorative stamp in 2010, and a Royal Canadian Navy ship now bears his name. When we think of William Hall's legacy, the important thing about it is, is the remarkable person that William Hall was. One who persevered in a very different and difficult time, a history that resonates today. Heidi Petrachik, Global News, Halifax. And that's Global National for this Monday. I'm Sonia Sunger. Tonight's Air Canada is this ice bridge in Wellington County, Ontario. Thanks for watching. Donna will be back with you tomorrow. Have a great night.